This is Heidi Joy Trethaway with the OpenStack Foundation and Jonathan Bryce, our Executive Director. This is our preliminary marketing kind of preview for the Metaka release. So without any further ado, Jonathan, would you please take it away for us? As, uh, as Heidi Joy said, you know, this is, this is kind of our uh, high-level overview of what Metaka represents. Um, you know, we're still a few weeks out from the release. And so, uh, you know, this is information that, that we have gathered with the help of the development leaders and the, uh, the product working group who did a lot of extensive work in, in going through every project and gathering detailed information and bubbling it up into themes. Um, but, you know, if, if there are uh, other pieces of, of feedback or other things that are interesting to you, we definitely want to hear that input as we, uh, as we get close to the release. Mitaka is the, the 13th release of OpenStack. OpenStack is a, is a framework for building cloud services and integrating all kinds of different technologies together. On the compute side, for instance, it's bringing together virtual machines, bare metal container frameworks, and, and doing that all under a single set of APIs um, so that, uh, that organizations can really take advantage of the diversity of technologies within their data center, um, and, uh, but without having to, to have a lot of different, uh, different islands of technology in their data center. And, you know, this is, this is a, a concept that, um, that we started talking about really in depth in, uh, in Vancouver last year. And as we have seen adoption um, ramp up um, with, with new deployments and, uh, and bigger deployments, it's been really cool to see how this is a, a message that uh, has definitely resonated with, with users and potential users. This is a situation that almost every organization is facing. They have a variety of technologies. They have a variety of needs. They have existing applications that they have to run at a, um, and continue to maintain, but they want to be able to, to develop new software, to deploy new applications faster and faster. And, uh, and OpenStack is really the only set of technologies out there that enable this, um, this diverse set of use cases and, uh, and the ability to integrate, um, you know, everything from a traditional enterprise storage system to, you know, a distributed open source storage system. So it's a, it's, it's a powerful set of tools and I think a, a powerful message that has, has really been resonating with a lot of the, the organizations that we, um, that we talk to. We've talked about this for the last couple of releases, but we've gotten past the, the core set of, of base level functionality, kind of the table stakes for, for cloud technology, and, uh, and the community has really focused on making it um, easier to, to deploy OpenStack, to manage it, to scale it. And, uh, and within the, uh, the Mitaka release cycle, another thing that I think was really important as a theme that emerged was, uh, was a focus on the experience of, of the cloud user, not just the cloud operator, but the end user of the cloud, the developer or the application deployer. And so there was a lot of work um, across uh, projects to, uh, to focus on things like the API and different elements of the user experience, uh, different uh, pieces of kind of the, uh, the, the user interface to provide more consistency and, and a better um, kind of unified platform experience for end users. Uh, the the uh, uh, manageability and scalability, a lot of work continues to go into those. We continue to see uh, really interesting new deployments, and, uh, and those operators are getting involved and bringing their feedback around what they need to see, whether it's, you know, I need, um, I need finer-grained security controls, I need more scalable orchestration, um, I need, you know, a, a, an easier way to, to deploy networking. Um, and, it's, and it's really awesome to see how that is feeding back into the development cycle, and, uh, and we're seeing, you know, um, specific, uh, specific work items that are coming out in response to those pieces of feedback. One of the things that, that was pretty cool to see come to fruition was work that's been done on the OpenStack client. There's a, a web interface that provides a graphical interface to, to manage OpenStack resources. Um, but there are also a lot of times when an end user wants to script specific actions against an OpenStack file, they want to be able to automate it or tie it into configuration management, 
or um, you know, uh, just work on a command line to, to perform bulk actions. There's a, a tool that's been being worked on. Uh, it's called the OpenStack Client, and uh, and it unifies the interface and the access across multiple OpenStack services. And so it, it's uh, it, it's pretty cool because the approach that it takes is very much how do you use OpenStack holistically as a platform, like providing a consistent set of calls for creating resources, whether you're creating a network, creating a block storage device, or creating a virtual machine. As an end user, I don't have to uh, to kind of learn the, the intricacies of each particular service API if I am trying to get started quickly and, and um, you know, script against them. So this, this is uh, something that really, I think, kind of provides a, a, a greatly improved end user experience. There's been improved support for software development kits across a number of different languages, again, so that programmatically developers can, can work with, uh, with OpenStack environments more effectively. One of the, uh, the API level improvements that was implemented in the Mutaka timeframe was a, uh, a function in Neutron, uh, which you know, is informally called Get Me a Network, um, but it's, it's, uh, it basically takes all of the steps necessary to create a network and uh, um, attach a, a server to it and, uh, and you know, give an IP to that server and, and really get it on the network and accessible down to a single function. This was one of those um, specific uh, pain points for people who were trying to move from Nova Network before to, uh, to Neutron, uh, because this was something that was simpler and, and kind of the simple Nova Network model, but was uh, more complicated when you moved over to the more powerful um, Neutron uh, system for, for managing networks. So this is, uh, this is something that the, the work in Neutron was completed for this, and We've already heard, this is, we actually talked to some operators and asked them, you know, what, what are some of the, the advancements that uh, you're really excited about? And this was one that, that they called out specifically. The next step is, um, is to integrate this fully into the compute um, side of things so that it really becomes a single call to basically get a server and get it on the network. It'll be even simpler than kind of in the old model. Manageability is really about how do we, uh, how do we improve the lives of the person who's operating the OpenStack cloud, that, that, uh, that cloud administrator. The projects have been working on simplifying the configuration for the different projects. In some cases, that means reducing the number of options. In some cases, it means putting in more defaults that, uh, so that you don't have to necessarily go through and set every single configuration option. And, uh, and we definitely saw a lot of, uh, a lot of work on this in, in Nova specifically. Um, Keystone, which is the identity management service to improve the setup for Keystone. And, uh, and you know, if you look at the, all of the steps that are necessary to get from, you know, I've installed Keystone to its running, to its authenticating against a backend service, to, you know, it's handing out the tokens that, that users need, authenticating requests and connecting to services. Um, they, they've now set this up so that, again, in a default scenario, it's basically one step to get through all of that. <laughs> and then um, continued improvements in Neutron for uh, layer three networking and, and DVR is distributed virtual router, which is basically a, uh, an improvement for availability and scalability of, of the routers that, uh, that Neutron creates on the network. You might remember that last time we talked about how there was a, a concept called a, a, a convergence engine <laughs> in, uh, that, that first appeared in Liberty and, uh, and continued to be developed on in Mitaka. And the, the idea there is that, um, you know, as you start to use heat, you end up with, with actions that can be split and distributed across multiple nodes, but uh, heat has to be aware of, uh, of what those actions are and if they can run in parallel or if they have to run in sequence. It's a pretty complicated logic to figure out on the, the, uh, the orchestration engine side. And so the heat team over the last few releases has been working to, to build that in um, so that, that it can be act in, in kind of a more distributed way and, and properly handle those, those different orchestration actions across a horizontally scaled deployment of heat. And that includes, um, you know, this mentioned stateless mode as well. That includes the ability to distinguish between um, actions that need to maintain state or actions that are stateless, 
And as you, you start to build all of that into the heat engine, you get to where you can uh, handle more complex and um, you know, a higher number of actions and a greater load inside your heat system as you, uh, you scale it out uh, horizontally. Designate is the DNS service. DNS zones are, are basically the set of, uh, of records that exist under a domain name, like www.openstack.org. When you are managing a, a DNS zone, you want those to be distributed across a lot of servers so you have high availability. But if you end up with a lot of DNS records, then distributing those around um, can, can start to impact performance and scale. And, uh, and so incremental zone transfers gives you the ability to, to basically do partial scale and partial replication of, of DNS updates. It makes it much more scalable as you create more and more DNS records. And again, you know, if you think about the point of OpenStack, it's to automate all of those different resources. And um, IPs and DNS are one of the things that in a cloud world are getting set up much more frequently um, because they're part of automated processes rather than, you know, in, in kind of the pre-cloud world where this was done manually by a network administrator. So you have to adjust the way that DNS systems are managed so that, um, you know, if you create 100 or 1,000 of these in a day, it doesn't uh, impact the performance of your DNS servers. Fernet tokens are uh, the, the new model now for how authentication tokens get passed around. And, uh, and uh, the, the Fernet token model is, is a model that doesn't require constant uh, lookups back to a central um, Keystone backend. So it, it, uh, it allows a, a Keystone service to be able to handle more authentication requests and an OpenStack cloud overall to be able to perform more, more actions without uh, Keystone becoming a bottleneck. And then the, the, last, uh, the last one that's mentioned here is uh, continued work on Cells D2 and the Nova project, as well as uh, um, more updates on the scheduler and, and the efforts that were started in the Liberty cycle around uh, um, Cells V2 and, and pluggable schedulers. Um, as a review, Cells is the concept that was brought into Nova a, a couple of years ago now as a way to um, to, to horizontally scale not just the nodes inside of, of a compute cluster, but actually to, to kind of horizontally scale out multiple compute clusters. And uh, the initial version was, was um, really useful for a specific set of use cases um, that it was initially developed for. But as, uh, as we've gone through the years, we have more and more cloud environments that are being passed hundreds to thousands and, and you know, even tens of thousands of, of physical nodes inside of their environment. And so having a, a, a horizontally scalable way to manage OpenStack environments across, um, you know, different, different uh, data center locations, different availability zones in a data center is really becoming a, a key point of, uh, of scale inside of OpenStack. Cells V2 is really the, uh, the, the re-architecture of that concept and, uh, and the, um, you know, the culmination of a lot of work with, uh, with different operators by the uh, NOVA development team. So there's been um, more good progress in, uh, in Mitaka on that. And that is, that's really going to be the uh, kind of the, the long-term model for, uh, for scaling compute in OpenStack. Here we have a, a quadrant with a few different categories of, of usage that we have um, started to see, you know, really taking off. Enterprise private cloud, these are organizations that, uh, that you know, you probably recognize because organizations that we've had speak at different OpenStack summits like Walmart and eBay and TD Bank. Um, but there's a new one in here, which is really, I think, one of those companies that's synonymous with enterprise technologies, and that's SAP. We've talked to SAP recently. And they're going to be speaking at the summit in, uh, in Austin, which is really exciting to, to have them uh, come and join us there. But, you know, they obviously create um, some of the most well-known enterprise software out there, but they themselves as a company, they also run a lot of different environments and have a pretty complex enterprise IT environment, which they are um, transitioning to, uh, to run on top of OpenStack. 
And so they, they have a, a, a great youth story, um, and uh, they're going to come talk about that in, in, uh, in Austin. Um, the uh, public cloud service providers, you know, that's one that, uh, that was one of the original use cases for OpenStack. And sometimes we don't talk about it as much, but we've, we've really started to see some cool success with different uh, service providers who are building out public cloud offerings on top of OpenStack technology. And in some cases, they are vertically focused on a specific industry or, you know, perhaps regionally focused. A couple of weeks ago, there were several announcements that came out from some of these companies. City Networks is a, is a company in Europe that operates a, a, a public cloud. And they have a specific public cloud offering for financial services organizations in the European Union. They announced a big user win with a, with a, a large insurance company in Europe. Um, Data Centered is a public cloud provider in the UK. And uh, HMRC, which is the, the tax service in the UK, announced that they were deploying their front ends for business and individual taxes uh, on top of Data Centered's cloud. So, you know, it's cool to see some of these these end users that are building on top of OpenStack Cloud. And then um, Deutsche Telekom just announced a, a major public cloud initiative using OpenStack. So it's cool to see that, that traction as well. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the, the uh, telecom industry and network functions virtualization. We're going to have AT&T speaking at the Austin Summit. They made some amazing progress in 2015. Um, They've talked about how they've deployed 74 data centers now with, uh, with OpenStack and are running production network workloads on top of those OpenStack environments in addition to internal enterprise workloads. They've, they've already been deploying it at, at, at big scale, but they have, uh, they have really large plans over the next few years as they continue to, to roll this out across their whole network. And uh, we see other telecoms all over the, the globe, like Deutsche Telekom, um, SK Telecom in, in South Korea, uh, Swisscom, and others who are, uh, Verizon and others who are building, you know, similar services. And then the final category is research and uh, academia and big data. Um, Nectar has been a long time OpenStack deployment in Australia. It's a, a combination of several OpenStack clouds that at different universities down there that provide a, a, a big pool of resources for researchers. Chameleon is a similar effort that is um, being deployed here in the U.S. There's actually um, one of the big locations is here in Austin at the University of Texas Advanced Computing Center, coordinated with University of Chicago and with the big grant from the National Science Foundation. It's running workloads already for several hundred researchers across the U.S doing some, some interesting stuff from biomedical things to machine learning. And so that's something that, you know, we've had CERN, for instance, has been a marquee user and, and driven a lot of strong leadership and involvement in, in OpenStack for years. Um, and it's cool to see that continuing to develop as, a, as an area of usage. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that have been going on in case if you're not familiar, I've been following some of the community activities over the last release cycle or six months. One really cool thing that happened this last weekend, we hosted our first OpenStack app hackathon. It took place in Taiwan, and it was in collaboration with the government as well as local universities, and then a couple of different um, you know, companies and organizations in the OpenStack ecosystem. And they had 36 teams who competed to, they were building um, kind of apps and projects that were focused on smart cities and kind of the future of, of smart cities. So it was a really cool competition. We actually had the Prime Minister of Taiwan that attended to support it and help give out some of the prizes. And we're actually flying the winning team to come to the Austin Summit and um, show off what they, what they built. And, um, most importantly, we've been working with the community um, and with the local organizers uh, to have this kind of be the pilot app hackathon, and it's a template that we're putting together to roll out um, in many different communities. We're hoping to run two or three more of these this year um, as we really focus on this um, app developer audience and generally educating more of uh, that ecosystem of people. Uh, Jonathan was talking about some of the 
new research users that we have. There's a new scientific working group that's come up. Um, we've had a lot of interest there. They're going to be having their first meeting at the Austin Summit. Um, and if it's something that you're interested in, there, there's uh, definitely something you should participate in and follow along. I think there's a, a wiki page with some of the group members and, and how to get involved. Um, we've talked for quite a while about NFB. Um, we've continued to build a strong relationship with OPNFB as well as quite a few telecom operators. We're seeing a lot of momentum and traction there. I believe that uh, next week, I know that we're going to be having a, a board meeting and then OPNFB is also going to be having a board meeting in the same location around the Linux Collaboration Summit and there's going to be some joint meetings um, happening there, just trying to build relationships between the communities and define more of that workflow so that OpenStack can be the, the platform for NFV. Finally, just wanted to call out the ops mid-cycle that happened in February in Manchester. It seemed like an extremely successful event. Um, you know, it was the first one that happened in Europe and we weren't sure how many people were going to attend and it ended up being at capacity, um, I believe between 150 and 200 people there, uh, but seemed like a very productive event. Overall, just getting the operators together and building out that community um, has really, I think, made an impact on the, the development process and also just helping them feel kind of more close to the community and heard. So, um, and I know that the product working group and the enterprise working group were also out there and meeting and sprinting on some content and um, just generally getting really ingrained with the operators and users, which was great to see. The app hackathon was really was really exciting because there were, as she mentioned, there were um, I think 36 teams, a couple hundred developers. There were actually a lot of female engineers that uh, that came to participate, and they built and deployed applications. I think almost 300 applications on top of an OpenStack environment that a, a local company had uh, had set up for that hackathon. Everything from an automated system for growing potatoes to uh, things to try to solve parking problems in a, in a big city, all kinds of interesting things. And as she mentioned, the prime minister came, was really impressed with the community, and, and actually, um, you know, since then we've seen uh, some really strong interest from a number of parts of the Taiwanese government and, and uh, academic institutions and having a strong participation in the Austin Summit. So overall, it was a really, really cool thing to see and, and a big success. Hand it back to you, Heidi Joy, to talk about the, uh, the, uh, the timeline for the MeTalker rollout. Thank you. We've added the Metaka release logo to our marketing assets, so that's openstack.org forward slash marketing. We'll have the press and analyst briefings coming up at the end of next week. So we are on the path to finalizing our press release and fine tuning the messaging. You've had the opportunity to really see us in um, full work mode and full draft mode. Um, that's why we call this kind of the marketing preview. So we're continuing to work on this um, over the next couple weeks. And then Thursday, April 7th, the birthday of Mataka. So we will have the release website live. It'll look very much like the Liberty website that you saw last round. We'll also have a demo video and we saw more than 30,000 views on YouTube of our Liberty Cycle demo video. People are really interested in seeing how the product works, and so um, I'm really excited to have that as a major asset available for you. That will also be part of our Mitaka release website. We'll have these graphics available, and um, then we'll be releasing the press release at 801 Pacific. Finally, you can also take a look at some of the interviews that we did with project team leaders about the Metaka design series. We started interviewing them right after the Tokyo summit and then all the way through the mid-cycle, talking to them about what the hot topics were for their team and then what features they were planning to deliver. And if you want to get a little closer to the action, hear straight from the PTL's mouth, learn a little bit more about the background of projects or the, the user concerns or major issues that they identified that they were working to solve in the Metaka release, I'd encourage you to take a look at this YouTube playlist that will go through many of those conversations. 
And then finally, I wanted to he- send a huge shout out to the product work group and specifically the roadmap team led by Shamil Tahir from IBM. They really killed themselves to pull together some amazing content for us. I'm hoping at the end of next week we'll be able to see a first look at that community generated roadmap. That includes a hundred foot view, kind of at that project level specific features or enhancements, a thousand foot view that kind of rolls that up into bigger themes or or bigger goals, and then that 10,000 foot view that really uh, um, looks at themes that unite all of these projects like scalability, modularity, manageability, um, some of the themes that Jonathan spoke to earlier this morning. So I'd really encourage you to take a look at the roadmap when it's released. Um, They'll also be doing a presentation at the Austin Summit, and it really helps you delve into all of the different things that are happening across the OpenStack ecosystem with regard to the projects and the new features coming out. That said, uh, I think we can wrap up now, and I thank you very much for joining us on this call.